Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to welcome you at the colloquium Social Ontologies after Deleuze. Uh, it's one of the first colloquiums that we are able to uh, hold after the COVID times. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome here Jan Buchanan. Uh, for him, it's also for the first time that he's allowed to leave Australia and uh, come to Europe. So I'm really happy that he can be here with us today. And uh, I don't think it's necessary to introduce uh, Jan uh, because uh, anyone who is here <laughs> is supposed to know him. But uh, <laughs> let me say <laughs> just a few words uh, to recollect uh, his uh, achievements. Uh, Jan Buchanan lectures at University of Wollongong. His previous position was Professor of Critical and Cultural Theory at the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory at Cardiff University. Uh, Jan has published on a wide variety of subjects across a range of disciplines, including literary studies, cultural studies, communication studies, and philosophy. He has published on film, literature, music, space, the internet, and war, as well as a number of other subject, subjects. He's author of uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Critical Theory and the founding editor of the international journal Dela Studies. He's also the editor of four book series, Dela's Connections, uh, Plateaus, Dela's Encounters, uh, critical connections. His publications include uh, Michel Deserto, Cultural Theorist, Deleuze, a Meta Commentary, Frederick Jameson, Life Theory, Deleuze and Gattari's Anti Oedipus, Assemblage Theory and Method, An Introduction and Guide, The Incomplete Project of Schizoanalysis, Collected Essays on Deleuze and Gattari. So, Jan, stage is yours. And you. once again, thank you very much for coming to Prague and being here with us. Thank you, Peter, for the extremely kind introduction. And um, so I, they tell you you shouldn't begin a talk with a, uh, an apology, but I'm going to have to make at least a couple of apologies. It seems that I was not fated to come to Prague, or at least if I was going to come to Prague, they were going to make it difficult. Um, my glasses broke literally five minutes before I left the house. Um, so these are reading glasses, which means I can see my text, but I can't see you. Uh, or I can see you, but I can't see my text. So um, I will be taking them on and off like an old person. So I guess it's a dress rehearsal for my retirement. Um, secondly, I have to make a, an additional apology. My uh, airline has decided that they don't want me to be here either. And they brought forward my flight from Friday to this afternoon. Um, so unfortunately, immediately... After I give this paper, I will be having to say farewell. So if I don't stop and chat, please don't be offended. I literally have to catch a taxi to the airport. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Peter for organising this at exceptional short notice. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to be here so early on a beautiful spring morning. So the paper that I'm uh, going to give is something that I have been working on for... Uh, most of my summer, your winter, and it's a sequel to the book on assemblage theory, uh, which I've wittily entitled Assemblage Theory and Affect. Um, and I, the short version of what I want to say is that we cannot understand assemblage theory if we don't factor affect into it. Uh, so if you write that part down, then you'll know exactly what my whole book is going to be about. Um, the rest will just be details to kind of make that argument seem plausible. So I want to start with a brief quote from A Thousand Plateaus, which I think uh, it's, you know, if you were going to get a tattoo from a Deleuze and Guattari, you would have this on your arm. Uh, it says, invoking causalities that are too general or uh, extrinsic, psychological or sociological, is as good as saying nothing. So the title of this paper is The Differential Method, and I want to make the claim that if you want to be a good Deleuzean, then you should be interested in the problem of specific causality, uh, and by extension that not enough people, particularly those people interested in the concept of the assemblage, have paid attention to this particular directive. Uh, as you can see, I like to start by insulting people, uh, and <laughs> the, 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 the rest of the paper will show why that's the case. So in the opening pages of Anti-Oedipus, we are told that the desiring machine, which is the forerunner to the assemblage, uh, does two things. 
it sets flows in motion and it disrupts flows. Uh, for every organ machine and energy machine, all the time flows and interruptions. Now, despite its prominence, uh, it's literally on page uh, three, uh, this key aspect of the concept of the assemblage has largely been overlooked or ignored by assemblage theory, and I would acknowledge that I have been guilty of this as well. Uh, yet, in the absence of this notion of flow, uh, which, like so many of Deleuze and Guattari's concepts, has a number of other cognates, such as flux and flight and so on, it is actually difficult to grasp what Deleuze and Guattari mean by saying desire is productive, because it is precisely flows that productive desire produces. So I guess what I'm also saying then is that you can't really understand desire if you do not think in terms of flows, but flows are not as obvious in terms of what they are as it may seem. Uh, this in turn makes it difficult to grasp what they mean by saying there is no desire but assembling assembled desire, because an assembling or machining desire is precisely desire grasped as a composite of flows and interruptions. So isolated from its fundamental relation to flow, it is easy to see how the concept of the assemblage has come to be understood as assembling of some kind of self-contained entity, when in fact it should be understood as an apparatus of capture and extraction engineered to engage with a specific type of flow. Factoring flow in, into how we think with and use the concept of the assemblage gives it an analytic dimension it otherwise lacks because it requires the application of what Deleuze and Guattari refer to as a differential method. Now, it can be stipulated then that assemblages can only be said to exist wherever flows are initiated, interrupted, disrupted, diverted, and or put to other ends. Okay, so no flow, no assemblage. Assemblages are neither self-generating nor self-sustaining, but always determined by both internal and external factors stemming from the interaction with flows they either produce or profit from. Uh, as is so often the case, Deleuze and Guattari's initial examples of what they mean by flows, blood, milk, urine, semen, shit, and so on, are misleading in as much that it makes it seem that flows must be both liquid and visceral, which is not the case, as their discussion later on in um, A Thousand Plateaus of metallurgy would make apparent. It also makes it seem that blood, milk, urine and so on are intrinsically flows, which again is not the case. So that's a really important point. These things are not intrinsically flows. Uh, the principal characteristic of a flow, and again, if you wanted to underline a key point, it would be this. The principal characteristic of a flow is that it is ideal, and in being so, if not actually, continuous and inexhaustible. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari sometimes use the term hyle in, pl in place of flow, which, as they define it, designates the pure continuity that any one sort of matter ideally possesses. Um, so, for all those people that continue to read Delanda, despite my constant advice not to, um, right there you see that Delanda is fundamentally wrong because he says, well, Deleuze and Guattari are not idealists, it's just false. There is any number of examples that you can find in their work where they speak uh, in idealistic terms. So they exemplify this point with an example from uh, Robert Jolin's account of an initiation ceremony observed in his fieldwork with the Sara peoples of Chad. Yolan uh, shows that the snuff used in the ceremony is viewed as, an, as a sample taken from a great single ball of snuff, and I'm quoting, that extends to the very limits of the universe. Identifying specific flows in relation to assemblages is a critical but neglected aspect of Deleuze and Guattari's project, and we need to start by asking how and under what conditions does a flow become ideal, continuous and inexhaustible? The answer, paradoxically, is that a flow becomes ideal precisely at the moment that it is interrupted. Uh, and here I'm quoting from them. They say, far from being the opposite of continuity, the break or interruption conditions this continuity. It presupposes or defines what it cuts into as an ideal continuity. The machine produces an interruption of the flow 
only insofar as it is connected to another machine that supposedly produces this flow. Now, I will admit that I've been reading, well, this is not admission so much, it's just true, I've been reading Deleuze and Guattari for probably two decades or more and have gl glazed over that sentence many times and only recently started to think what it might actually mean. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just give you a, an example to help you think about it. So I think social media can be understood as an ongoing demonstration of this point. Uh, Facegram, Facebook and Instagram came into being right at the moment that digital photography and mo mobile phones began to create such a super abundance of images. By creating platforms where these images could be curated, exhibited and archived, they cut into this flow of images and at the same time created it and in doing so unleashed their own flows or what we know today as the feed which does indeed appear to be ideal, continuous and inexhaustible. Bulging digital folders, uh, overwhelming hard drives and memory sticks everywhere only became a flow at the moment that a machine capable of extracting a surplus from them appeared. So those of you, because I, I can't actually see your faces, some of you may be old enough to remember a time before social media when you took digital photographs and you just store them on a hard drive um, as opposed to just uploading them to a cloud. So what I want you to do is to cast your mind back to that moment and think, well, you know, what, all those folders full of photographs, uh, they were not yet flow. The discrete picture folders digital cameras users maintained until that moment were all isolated from one another and therefore discontinuous and limited by the memory capacity of the hard drives where they were cached. These images were rendered continuous when uploading them to social media became possible. This new flow of images in turn depended upon at the same time created a new flow of what we now refer to as attention and in the process massively accelerated the so-called attention economy. So the crucial point is that the flow takes the form of a connective synthesis and and then and and and, and so on. Now Again, this is something that I have a sentence that I've read many, many times and, and have thought, well, you know, it seems obvious what and, and, and means. But in fact, it's not as obvious as, as you might think. And, and the first thing we have to think about is that and, and, and does not mean addition. Um, so this, this flow can be said to exist wherever this pattern of continuous connection can be found in its ideal continuous form. Now, this is not an additive model. Uh, and despite how it may seem, because the product, namely its flow, uh, is different in kind to the component parts. More importantly, the flow may take the appearance of and, 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 but it is not created by means of addition. Indeed, it is generally created by means of subtraction. All the billions of photos locked away in hard drives did not become a flow until the structure of discontinuity separating them all was removed by busting them out of their discrete folders and placing them into a feed. Simply adding picture upon picture into a theoretically infinite folder would not, does not create flow. First, the barriers between the folders had to remove. So and, and, and looks like addition, but in fact, it presupposes subtraction. So the differential method is used by Deleuze and Guattari to establish sharp distinctions between different types of assemblages and different types of flows. In any given situation, it is likely to be the case that multiple assemblages and multiple flows will be in operation. It is also likely that some of the assemblages and some of the flows will be so intimately connected with other assemblages and flows as to be almost indiscernible from one another. To complicate matters further, it is also entirely likely that some flow may be intersected by multiple assemblages. Likewise, one assemblage may intersect with more than one flow. Now, it is tempting to view this complex interweaving of assemblages and flows as a mess, uh, as John Laws put it. Um, but as I have argued elsewhere, this way of seeing things results in a kind of analytic defeat, whereby all we can say is that everything is somehow connected. Uh, and this not only states the obvious, it also misses the point entirely of Deleuze and Guattari's project, which is always a matter of determining specific causalities. Now, this brings me to the first of several points of contention between Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the assemblage and the version that has emerged since their death under the banner of assemblage theory. 
Because the one thing that most post Deleuze and Guattari accounts of the assemblage argue, uh, or sorry, argue against, is the existence of specific causality. So, for instance, Jane Bennett's highly influential concept of distributed agency is emblematic in this regard. Bennett wages a perpetual and, as it were, total war against specific causality by constantly undermining the very idea that it would ever be possible to arrive at a point where one could say that the agency of one thing did not depend on the agency of another thing. Uh, as she says, on close enough inspection, the productive power that has engendered an effect will turn out to be a confederacy and that the human actants within themselves turn out to be a confederation of tools, microbes, minerals, sounds, and other foreign materialities. Uh, this disposition towards always seeing the bigger picture, as it were, is obviously salutary in many ways, and it has no doubt inspired a great many scholars in the human and social sciences to look more deeply into the material conditions enabling and sustaining their objects of inquiry. The trouble is, this constant focus on the material elements of the assemblage obscures the fact that the assemblage itself is not itself material and cannot be grasped in purely material terms. Uh, and, and this is a point that I have made before, but it becomes especially important when we start to consider the relation between affect and assemblages. Uh, Bennett's emphasis on extensive bodies, which she takes from Spinoza, leaves little place or no place for intensive bodies or affects. Now, I'm not going to have a big argument about Spinoza here, but it becomes very crucial how we think about what Spinoza may or may not have meant by affect um, and whether or not you think affects can circulate independently of material things. Now, for Bennett, all affects are kind of attached to a material thing, whereas I think what Deleuze and Guattari are saying is that affects are pure intensities and can circulate independently of a material thing. And, and that's a big argument for another day. Um, the vital force that she likes to speak of, which uh, may at first glance seem similar to their notion of intensities, only ever emanates from a material thing, never from an idea, a feeling, or emotion. As such, her model of the assemblage um, cannot account for such things as fascism or Buddhism, both of which are ways of being in the world that are centred on beliefs and not necessarily tied to material things. Now, to my mind, this is a fatal flaw because we already have notions like ecology or systems theory to help us to think about the interactions and dependencies between material objects. But what we don't have is an adequate theory of the different way desires work to constitute the world we live in. And to me, that's precisely what Deleuze and Guattari were trying to invent. Uh, and I think they obviously took us a long way down the path. Uh, they obviously drew on ecological thinking and systems theory in the development of their ideas, but it is false to think that the assemblage belongs to the same family of concepts. Uh, its purpose is quite different. It's important to remember that it began life as a way of rethinking Freud's notion of the psychological complex uh, and its subsequent development continues to bear this trace. Uh, now, it's not my intention here to kind of work through all the misreadings of Deleuze and Guattari, um, which I have done elsewhere anyway, uh, even those that I would want to classify as strong misreadings in Harold Bloom's sense, um, and, and I would say that Jane Bennett's falls into that category. So the idea of the strong misreading is that even if you think it's a misreading, it's still powerful and suggestive and, and enables you to do all kinds of important work. So I, I'm certainly not suggesting that, that Bennett's work is not um, stimulating in many ways, but I do think that it limits how we engage with Deleuze and Guattari, and so therefore it's worth uh, engaging with that aspect of it. In particular, I want to argue against the everything is connected view of things that has become entrenched in assemblage theory. And there are two reasons that I want to do this. Uh, firstly, because it actually goes against Deleuze and Guattari's own conception of the concept. Um, but before I turn to that, I also want to start by acknowledging that this is in fact an old debate, um, which seems to have a zombie quality in as much that no matter how often it's repudiated, it still doesn't die. Um, and doubtless this is because it's an, it answers to an ideological purpose rather than a conceptual need. So philosophers have been waging war on totalities since before Lyotard announced that is what we are supposed to do, uh, without ever really explaining why, 
say that totalities are allegedly what fascists and Stalinists and I guess now Putinists dream of. Um, but as Frederick Jameson shows, this is conceptually false on at least two grounds. First, totalizing is not the same thing as homogenizing, uh, and any attempt to totalize an object must necessarily include its internal agonistics. Second, totalizing is in fact a weapon. It uses the power of abstraction to counter the processes of obfuscation that enable exploitative political thinking um, to appear benign. Uh, and Jameson also argues that the war against totality is a war against utopian thinking, which for him means any form of thought capable of imagining something beyond what there is, something other than what we already have and appear destined only to have. Now, if one crossed out utopian thinking and instead wrote nomadic thought, it would soon be obvious that despite appearances to the contrary, that Deleuze and Guattari are in fact utopian thinkers. I mean, the very definition of nomadic thought is that it, it begins from the outside. You can only get to the outside through a process of totalization to begin to say this is what there is and now we want to think about what is beyond. So even if we accept that on some level everything is related or connected, a position that would not be inconsistent with Deleuze's rendering of the notion of univocal being as it is conceived by Duns Scotus and Spinoza, that does not mean that everything is the same or that it is necessarily related in the same way with the same effect. And this, I would argue, is implicit in the concept of the rhizome, which is frequently misread as implying that everything is connected, when in fact precisely the opposite is the case. The therapeutic idea behind the concept of the rhizome is that everything can be connected, not that everything is connected. If everything is already connected, if there is no outside to the set of connections that we feel ensconced in, then there is no way out. It is precisely as a way out, as a line of flight, that the rhizome is supposed to function. If you are feeling blue and you hear a song that reminds you of a happy memory, that, then the song functions as a rhizome to you that helps you to find a way out of your particular black hole by enabling you to move forward and graft what we might think of as a happy or joyous affect onto a sad affect. Um, and as Deleuze and Guattari argue, some relations are healthy and some are not, and we need to develop an art of dosages, as they call it, to determine which relations are beneficial and which are harmful. But to do that, we have to set about differentiating between assemblages by drawing boundaries, albeit sometimes fuzzy boundaries, between them. This means, contrary to Bennett, that the assemblage is not and indeed cannot be a non-totalizable sum, as she puts it, because if that were the case, it would be literally impossible to determine which elements belong to one assemblage and not another. Now, Bennett's version of assemblage theory tends to look at assemblages from the inside, as it were, noting how one element connects to another and to another and so on. The analysis is essentially focused on tallying up and constantly increasing the number of connections observed or identified between the elements of what she conceives as a non-totalizable whole. Now, Bennett does not try to say why this or that element is included in an assemblage, say that they are in some kind of perceivable dependent relation, um, though she never differentiates between types of dependencies, nor does she try to say why this or that element uh, is excluded. Uh, indeed, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen her speak of an excluded element ever, uh, and she seems not to have any conceptual means whereby she could exclude an element from consideration. Uh, for instance, Bennett says the electrical grid, I'm quoting here, the electrical grid is better understood as a volatile mix of coal, sweat, electromagnetic fields, computer programs, electron streams, profit motives, heat, lifestyles, nuclear fuel, plastic, fantasies of mastery, static legislation, water, economic theory, wire and wood. Now, it would be fine if one were to view this as a messy starting point and from there try to disentangle all the different assemblages and their associated flows at work, um, but that is not how she proceeds. On the contrary, she exacerbates the mess by piling up the connections without any regard for the tensions that might or must be at work uh, in this endlessly expanding universe that she documents. 
So in fact, Bennett's additive model of the assemblage moves us away from deleuze guattari's conception of the assemblage as the keystone of a differential method um, of analysis whose goal is to identify both the specific nature of causality of individual assemblages and, and this is crucial, the essential differences between assemblages. So the additive model, as I'm going to call it, is problematic in three ways. First, it fails to register the fact that assemblages have cutting edges, i.e. an outside which defines the limit of their reach. Second, it fails to register the fact that assemblages cannot be added to without changing their nature, and this is uh, explicitly stated in the, um, deleuze Guattari's definition of the multiplicity. Um, and third, it gives the, the assemblage an agency independent of its situation or circumstances. So the fundamentally random or happenstance nature of Bennett's model of the assemblage then is problematic because it leaves us unable to explain either the particularity or the mutability of assemblages, which are the two key concerns of their differential method. Um, and as they point out, the actual composition of an assemblage is only important insofar as it facilitates the achievement of a highly specific effect. And this is the sense in which they are particular. The assemblage is a specific machine contrived to produce a specific effect. In this sense, then, it is in no way accidental or what amounts to the same thing, emergent, uh, which is Delander's word. But having said that, Sometimes it is possible to achieve the same effect by different means, which points to an inherent plasticity of the assemblage. Um, and here one might think of Henry Miller's uh, famous experiments on getting drunk on pure water that Deleuze Guattari talk about. At other times, the same apparent means can be used to achieve quite different ends, which indicates the, that the plasticity of the assemblage is not infinite. There is always a breaking point. Uh, for example, uh, and again, I'm taking this example from Deleuze Muttari, not every, not every I love you means I love you. Um, so these three problems combined effectively cripple the concept of the assemblage as an analytic tool. In the absence of an outside, we cannot differentiate between elements that belong to one assemblage and not another because there is effectively no other assemblage. Nor can we think about the different ways the assemblage undergoes transformation from within if we do not first grant that the assemblage has an interior. This transformation is not a matter of emergent properties because the tensions do not arise solely from the interaction of materials. Rather, they reflect the assemblage's capacity to accommodate and respond to changes to the external environment, uh, something that, again, is unthinkable in the absence of an outside. So instead of this additive view, we need to take what I want to call a metamorphic view, which directs us to do three things. First, draw a boundary line around a specific assemblage. Second, identify the flows the assemblage draws its sustenance from uh, and follows their lines of convergence and divergence. And third, explore the tenses internal to the assemblage that record the history of its development in the way, say, that a tree ring tells the story of the life of a tree and the line of flight that leads towards change. Now, Deleuze and Guattari offer a set-piece demonstration of this point in their analysis of the distinction between weapons and tools. Now, this is a, a remarkable eight pages or so in the um, nomadology section of A Thousand Plateaus. And again, it's something that you can skim over a hundred times and not really notice it. But if you allow yourself to be caught by the extraordinary things that they say in it, then you come to see that the assemblage really is quite different from how we have initially thought about it. Um, so... I think this case study is additionally interesting because it brings into play the, the, nation, the notion of affect, which is why it's part of this project. So the properties of material things only interest them insofar as they are apprehended and applied by different social machines. But it is the differences between the social machines that is of primary importance to them, not the properties of the material objects. They set aside material differences right from the outset as not being sufficient in themselves to draw a sharp delineation between weapons and tools. Um, and it is worth adding here that Deleuze Muttari frequently insists uh, that all assemblages have cutting edges. Of course, they say, an extrinsic differentiation between weapons and tools can always be made on the basis of usage, but they say this is a relatively weak form of distinction because it does not preclude a convertibility between the two. 
It may even be the case, they admit, that an intrinsic definition between weapons and tools is out of reach because they both share the same machining, phylum. But having said that, they nevertheless insist that there are internal differences between the weapons assemblage and the tools assemblage that even if they do not rise to the level of intrinsic differences are still worth considering because of the light it sheds on the nature of the war machines as they want to define it. In other words, they are saying that even if two objects, one classified as a tool and another classified as a weapon, are identical in a quantitative sense, so if you're holding a hammer, for example, uh, i.e. in a material sense, they can and still should be regarded as different in a qualitative sense. So here one might compare the warrior's battle axe with the forester's tree felling axe. Materially, they are very similar, made from the same materials, but in design and purpose they are very different, right down to the filigree that decorates the weapon but is absent in the tool. The differential method uses qualitative differences to draw distinctions between different types of assemblages. Okay, so it's the qualitative that they focus on. So as a first approximation, they say weapons have a privileged relation with projection. Anything that throws or is thrown is fundamentally a weapon, and propulsion is its essential movement. The weapon is ballistic. The very notion of the problem is related to the war machine. The more mechanisms of projection a tool has, the more it behaves like a weapon, potentially or metaphorically. To which they add the important qualification that even though tools can also be shown to have mechanisms of projection, they constantly seek to compensate for this or else adapt them to other needs so that on balance they are predominantly interceptive. The weapon also has an essential relation with speed. Um, and, the, and here I'm quoting, they say, it is yet another essential contribution of Virilio to have stressed the weapon speed complementarity. The weapon invents speed, or the discovery of speed invents the weapon. Uh, and this in turn opens still another line of differentiation, uh, this time between hunting and warfare. So in contrast to the weapon then, the tool is interceptive. It prepares a matter from a distance in order to bring it to a state of equilibrium or to appropriate it in the form of an interiority. Um, and again, it is worth adding here that this is precisely the opposite of Delander's claim that assemblages do not concern relations of interiority. Uh, consider the example of the construction of a house. The frame of the house draws material together and creates not just an interior space, but also an interiorizing relation between all the materials. Um, and this point can perhaps be seen more clearly by considering the abstract idea of a house. What must a house contain? Must it have a toilet? Must it have a kitchen, a bedroom, and so on? Um, is it still a house if it lacks any of these things? And what are the limits? Can it have a kitchen but no bedroom, a bedroom but no kitchen? The point that I'm making here is that all of these relations are in fact relations of interiority. It is true that the materials can be separated from any particular construction and used elsewhere, but that does not mean that when they are fastened together that the relations between them are exclusively exterior, as Delander claims, because there is nothing stopping them from being bound in a relation of interiority as well. Uh, the irony here, if that's the right word, is that Delander fails to draw the obvious conclusion from the point he insists on. If relations are external to their terms, as he constantly insists, then it cannot be the interaction of the properties of the terms that define the nature of the assemblage. So even if we said he was right, he would still turn out to be wrong. Um, so obviously um, there's a lot more that could be said and done and I've probably insulted enough people. So I'll bring it to not a conclusion but a place at which we can stop and, and have some kind of discussion. So I guess the last thing I'm saying then is that the assemblage is primary uh, weapons and tools, for example, are consequences. Um, and Deleuze and Guattari point to the example of the hoplite weapons, they say two-handled shield, long spear and short stabbing sword, which only came into being because of the phalanx, which is a weaponized arrangement of bodies, and the medieval knight's lance and sword, which are products of the fusion of humans and horses as a mobile weapon. And the same logic applies to tools. For instance, the heavy plough only came into its 
own when long open fields replace small closed lots as the dominant modes of land use in European agriculture. But this is first of all a social arrangement because it has to do with the distribution of land and agreed rules about land use, which in turn implies a political arrangement between landowners, rulemakers and land users subject to them. And social arrangements then are of necessity arrangements of desire. Uh, and this is the one absolute rule of the concept of assemblage. All assemblages are assemblages of desire. Uh, and Deleuze and Guattari are explicit on this point. The assemblage does not work in the absence of desire. It would then simply be an inert collection of bodies and signs. Thank you. still come up against certain questions and one of them that they bring up is that in what sense does the schizoid investment constitute to the same extent as the other one a real investment of the socio-historical field and not a simple utopia um, now I have always had the sense that they are strongly utopian in, in anti-Oedipus and I think that's the influence of Nietzsche in a sense um, but why are they so worried about utopia as a, as a kind of... Why are they worried to be called utopian? Does it have anything to do, do you think, with maybe um, an opposition against some kind of revolutionary idealism as a kind of maybe impotent posturing um, versus, you know, active, well, action in general? Um, uh, is it, and I'm, and I'm asking, and I'm asking this because Deleuze sort of says a very similar thing toward the end of his life in the postscript on the societies of control, in the famous sentence that there's no need for hope or fear, uh, only to find new weapons. So, what is the problem with utopia and with hope or faith and things like that? Do you think? So I I tend to think that Jameson is right about these, the way by which utopia has been politicized. Um, and so I, th I guess if you kind of place Anti-Oedipus back into its context of being written in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, and post-68 and, and time of, of Maoists and, and you know, Stalinists and so on and so forth, Utopia c came to be discredited as a word because it came to be associated with, uh, particularly with, with sort of a Maoist view of the world, um, and so in some ways, you know, where you see them hesitating to talk about utopia, you are also seeing them hesitate to be associated with, with Badu and with Maoism and, and so on. So I think there's, there is a kind of internal politics of, of Paris that helps to explain the, the hesitation around that word. But they are also quite explicitly in favour of Fourier and, and think that he, he provides a, a very important contribution to understanding and thinking about how desire works. Um, they also acknowledge that um, Adorno's negative dialectics may well be the best way of thinking about utopia and so on. But they keep coming back to saying, but we don't think it's a very good word. But I think that can only be explained in terms of the, the politicization of the word itself. Uh, and I think that's what Jameson is, is, is very interesting in the ways by which he looks at how that word has been politicized and discredited. But I think, like, if you perform the sort of mental experiment that I suggest, whereby you just simply cross out utopia and write nomadic thought, it, it suddenly becomes very clear that it is a form of utopian thought because it is premised on finding the outside of where we are uh, and, and finding a new space in a new direction, which would be how I would define utopia. Uh, so, um, I would like to thank you for your talk, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I have one question concerning uh, the social media, because you mentioned uh, the abundance of images and the fact that there are like, flows of attention, and uh, I think there are also some really important assemblages of desire going on in these flows, because, for example, there can be um, 
many um, fake news shared on social media that um, create a very uh, huge impact, huge uh, emotional flows because people get stressed or they become angry or they become like they share some kind of affectivity which is triggered by this picture, I think. So uh, what do you think about um, using of these pictures as some kind of weapons? Do you think it can be used as a, as a weapon to trigger some kind of flows in this sense, like a, some kind of war machine? Oh, look, I think I completely agree. Like it's, it's very clear that social media has been and can be weaponized, like that, that's beyond dispute. The tricky part is to th is to think whether or not we want to think of it as a war machine in the way that Deleuze and Guattari want us to think about it as a war machine, uh, because they start off with a definition of war machine that is quite militaristic, but then end up with a definition of the war machine that is in fact quite utopian. So it's I, it it's not so I I wouldn't be able to say how we would disentangle all those threads right at this moment, but I would say that we would need to be able to disentangle the threads in order to get to that point. Um, I think what's what's useful to, to begin to think about is is to see social media as as constructing multiple flows that it's not just one flow it's not just one flow of images and that there are multiple assemblages at work uh, and begin to think well how, what are the sp the specific causalities of these assemblages and it's not it's not social media that created conspiracy theories or fake news and whatever I mean those things kind of already existed. Um, social media makes it possible for them to be accelerated and to dis be distributed in a different way and to develop new components. So I think it's interesting to then to go back and think, well, why, why was this the way that this particular form of, of a paranoid view of the world decided to go? Um, and, and what kinds of apparatuses of capture were they able to create to capture these images? Um, I mean, the, the sort of anti-vax position which is something that I have been recently engaging in, partly because it's, my brother is very anti-vax. And like we've had many, many pointless arguments. But one of the most extraordinary things that I've come to understand about the anti-vax argument is that when I step back from it, I, I think, well, the things that I agree with them about is I don't trust the media, I don't trust Big Pharma, I don't really trust government. I would encourage all my students and everybody I know to take a critical attitude to all of those things. But how is it that I end up with a position whereby I think it's probably a good thing to have the vaccination and my brother arrives at a position which thinks it's undoubtedly a bad thing to have the vaccination. And to me, being able to separate out those threads is kind of, that should be the point of assemblage theory. Because it seems to me that, that my brother and I are kind of doing the same thing but are arriving at completely different positions. Um, and so I think that differential method to me would mean how do we trace these specific lines so that we can see the components of these assemblages as functioning quite differently. Yeah. So not an, exactly an answer to your question, yeah. but kind of an encouragement to kind of pursue it. I've quite a lot because I'm um, working on fake news and uh, especially related to coronavirus crisis mm. because I, I was really interested by the different reactions and really the emotional flows that uh, somehow captured the attention of so many people and they uh, suddenly joined the flow and there were active extra movement uh, all around the Europe but especially here in Czech Republic uh, there were demonstrations um, mm -hmm. in the town square for example so it really uh, Push people to to together even physically in the in the town square. So it, it was so so strong. So I think it, not just images. It's, it's really some kind of desire. Oh yeah, no, and and I I you know there's a lot more analysis that needs to be done of that. But mm -hmm. I guess what I'm suggesting is that we need to start by delving into the kind of toolbox that Deleuze and Guattari have given us and see it as being far more sophisticated than so far assemblage theory has tended to look at it. Um, mm. This is kind of a joke, but it's also true. My brother is is basically illiterate. So we're like chalk and cheese. I spent all my life reading. He spent all his life riding horses. But now... He's reading scientific papers and sending them to me and saying, but look at this on page whatever or whatever of this, you know, scientific articles. It's, it's extraordinary. So I, I keep telling him, look, if nothing else, it's got you reading, so I'm happy. So, 
So, when I, so you, one of the things that I, I think about the particular way that new materialists in particular have taken up the assemblage and, um, and interpreted it is that they painted themselves into a corner because their interpretation of the assemblage is really based on the critiques they have of metaphysical individualism, of subjectivity, and of anthropomorphism. And so there's no place that they can talk about, first of all, the human. And this principle of selection that you're talking about is too close to agency, which they want to kind of sort of have to almost deny. Um, if there is any kind of agency, you have like the agential realism type thing where it's just sort of based on potentialities or something, right, of, that, of all the elements. And that's like the weakest form of agency that they would even allow, right? And so I guess my question is, because I, I mean, I, I think that's very problematic because I think when I say they paint themselves in their corner, you can no longer talk about human influence at all. <laughs> and it's very problematic for just these reasons. And I guess, you know, um, so I'm sympathetic to the critiques about sort of historically um, there has been a kind of imposition of particular interests of human beings on the environment and et cetera, et cetera, where it comes from. But I think that what you're doing is really important because you're demanding that, you know, there has to be a principle of selection and that's part of what this assemblage is. So I would like to maybe think, how can we actually have a conversation or do conceptualize agency in a way that sort of retains a more robust sense but still sort of allows for kind of a, a proliferation of different kinds of agents? Yeah, it's a, a tough question to answer. Um, <laughs> But I think it's an, it's the necessary next question, um, and I guess that the, it sort of comes down to, in some ways, a kind of an ex experimentation approach. That there is a when you have an assemblage, you start to experiment within the assemblage, and then it can create new possibilities that you didn't know were there when you first created that assemblage, um, and when you have multiple people <coughs> contributing to a particular assemblage, then then the, the space for innovation and so forth come on. Um, and, and probably most histories of the development of, of the transformations of, of weaponry or agriculture or whatever would pursue that path. But what is always extraordinary is that, we, like, when you look at the history of European agriculture, it was for hundreds of years without change, you know, like from almost Roman times till midway through the medieval period, they, they did agriculture in exactly the same way. Um, so no innovation really came from within that, it came from without. And so I think that's sort of what they're saying with the idea of the war machine, is that innovation doesn't always come from within the assemblage. Sometimes the innovation comes when that assemblage crashes into another assemblage uh, and so on. So, you know, in, in the case of uh, European agriculture, it started to happen with the breakdown of feudalism, the enclosure of the commons and, and the rise of industrialization. But I think what the other issue here is that um, there's a tendency within Delander and so forth to sort of see this as path dependent, that one thing leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing. But Delander and Carrie say we can only say that retrospectively and we can only say that providing we understand that each one of those moments was a contingency. Because, you know, the, the same de developments did not happen all over the world at the same time. Um, and, and in some places never happened. So one of the, the great examples is the Inca peoples had invented the wheel, but they only ever put the wheel on their children's toys because it had no value to them. Like if you've ever been to the Andes, you know, the mountains are like this. Wheels are not really that useful. Um, and they put everything on the back of llamas and llamas carry things around. So, you know, inventions don't automatically create or, or cause things to happen. And I think that's the kind of, to me, that's the implicit problem with, with new materialism. If everything is the result of the properties of things, then it can't explain why it fails to emerge in one place, but it does emerge in another place. Wheels are unimportant in the Andes, but they're important in Europe, let's say. Uh, and so I think we need a, a more highly differentiated model of the assemblage to account for that. Yeah, I, I mean, it just I think that one could just say, well, they're just wrong about that. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that they're the you can't excise and the, uh, the human from this, and that there are these interests actually do have important effects, and the uh, the the attempt or the desire to flatten that and say it's sort of an equi 
prime primordial or something to all other kinds of properties is just wrong. Yes, but I was trying to be nice. <laughs> but also to acknowledge that you've asked the, the, the question that I should really make chapter two, which is how to, how to explain causality once you've decided that yes. this model of causality is wrong. I look forward to that. Later. <laughs> so the last question, please. Uh, actually, uh, I was just wondering if, like, I mean, it's maybe a strange, silly question, but like, how can we um, differentiate conceptual assemblages from material ones? Um, because, like, for example, I'm like, object-oriented ontology interests me not because it explains the material terribly well, but it, it explains how we think about objects in terms of language um, much better. And, 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 and so the thing is, I think also we, you know, like when we think about objects, we also think about them in an assemblage way, but it's abstracted, <coughs> and, and, and so this is a completely different system than like material assemblages. And, um, and if I would give like an example, like a concrete one with, you know, things on the internet. At the moment I work on a website where I, like, um, we sell ads for furniture, and I say this is a like, dinner table, this is a coffee table, and, and I think this is exasperated by the internet and economy on the internet in particular because um, you buy a picture of a table, you never actually, but like, so every individual table <coughs> is uh, different, that, and you can see that in the reviews, someone got like a crap table and they get one star, and someone else got a perfect table and it gets five stars. So the material tables are different, but the conceptual tables are more abstracted and the same. And so I find that, in a sense, useful. So I'm just wondering if we're thinking about assemblages in terms of language, they're going to be functioning completely differently than the actual material ones. And I'm just wondering if that's part of the kind of misunderstanding or, or like different interpretations that one is more going towards this linguistic like model mm. where things have qualities, they have properties and even in this when we're buying things on the internet we're always filtering according to these kinds of qualities and so yeah. that even exasperates this idea that the tables are the same conceptually even though materially they're not. Right, so I guess the, the part about that example that would be missing from my perspective is that, that Deleuze and Tari talk about the assemblage as being constituted by both a, a material dimension and a semiotic dimension. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, we don't apprehend the table as a table, we apprehend the table as, as a series of signs, but those signs are also affect driven. So when we look at a table, we, we might think it's a nice table. Mm -hmm. And so there is already an affective dimension to it. Um, so I, again, this is a big part about Deleuze and Clara's work that people just kind of eyes glaze over. But there is a very detailed and, and kind of deep critique of structural semiotics built into this book as well, that, that we cannot really think about the assemblage without engaging this critique of semiotics and, and their retooling of semiotics which again doesn't function outside of a model of the assemblage. Um, so I think that that's the long, the long answer would be we'd need to bring semiotics back into the picture. Mm -hmm.